On November 11, 1918, Germany signed the Armistice Agreement, officially ending the First World War after more than four years of fighting. The war was over, but the work wasn't done yet. The next question was how to deal with the defeated country, which was basically Germany. In January 1919, 27 representatives of the victorious countries gathered in Paris for the famous Paris Peace Conference. Of these 27 countries, only five had real speaking rights, Britain, France, the United States, Japan, and Italy. Japan was known as the silent partner here because it was only concerned with Asian interests and didn't care about Europe, so there was nothing to say. Italy had a negative contribution to the war, and it would have been better not to divide the spoils of war. What good would you get? Besides, Italy was not interested in Germany, and the territories it wanted were all from the former Austro-Hungarian Empire. So the Italian Prime Minister Orlando kept raising his hand at the conference and said, Triest of the Austro-Hungarian Empire must be given to us Italians, and so must Fiume. But the British, French, and Americans ignored him. Didn't you see that we were discussing how to deal with Germany? Go outside and have some Italian food and coffee. When Orlando saw that he was ignored, he went back in a huff, I'm not playing. No one tried to keep him, and the conference wasn't about Orlando leaving, so you can go your own way and we can save the budget for one person's food and drink. Orlando returned home from Paris and the Parliament asked him, what did you bring back for us from Paris? He said he brought nothing back because the people at the meeting made him angry, so he came back. The Parliament was shocked. How could you do that? You have to go back and finish the meeting. So Orlando had to reluctantly go back. When he returned, no one was excited to see him. Oh, you're back. We've been waiting for you. No, you can come and go as you please. One more or one less doesn't make a difference. In this case, it was really up to the power of Italy. Japan didn't say anything, Italy couldn't say anything. So the Paris meeting was actually just between England, France, and the U.S. The main demand of the U.S. is the 14-point principle of President Wilson, hoping that all future things will revolve around these 14 points. These 14 principles can be summarized as follows, freedom of navigation, self-determination of nations, establishment of the League of Nations, reduction of armaments, and no secret diplomacy. In plain terms, these terms are for the U.S. to seek world power. Since 1894, the U.S. has been the world's top industrial power. After more than 20 years as the world's richest country, the world's politics still revolve around Europe. Of course, the U.S. is not willing to be Europe's little brother anymore. So these principles are all purposeful. For example, advocating self-determination of nations and establishing the League of Nations, the purpose is to allow all nations of the world to build their own countries. This weakens the status of old colonial empires such as Britain and France. At the start of the conference, things got off to a rocky start. Canada's request for an independent seat was denied by U.S. President Wilson, who was worried that if Canada became independent, it would be one more vote for the U.K. Canada's Prime Minister angrily declared, We have over 60,000 soldiers who died in the war, more than the Americans. If all these lives can't win us a seat, then I advocate a collective boycott of the conference by the self-governing colonies. Seeing that this wouldn't work, with everyone refusing to attend the conference, Wilson had no choice but to agree to let the colonies and self-governing territories attend. Other cases were pretty much the same, since the 14 points were in conflict with the interests of Britain and France. If freedom of the seas was mentioned, Britain would definitely not agree. The British Empire had been the world's hegemon for hundreds of years, and it was all thanks to their monopoly of the seas. If this was opened up, it would be like Britain committing suicide. If you talked about reducing armaments, France wouldn't agree either. They had just barely beaten Germany, and now was the time to finish them off. If you asked them to reduce armaments, wouldn't that be indirectly allowing Germany to rise again? So, as soon as Wilson mentioned the 14 points, Prime Minister Lloyd George and French Prime Minister Clemenceau joined forces to oppose him, and the three of them had a very lively argument. Wilson sighed wearily, I'm dealing with two bullies. To which Clemenceau replied, Wilson thinks he's Jesus Christ. 
The British and French were united in their bullying of the U.S., but the tension between the two of them was even greater. After the war, France suddenly realized that Russia and the Austro-Hungarian Empire had been wiped out and Germany had been defeated. Now, it should be the undisputed leader of Europe. Suddenly, the glory of the Napoleonic era had returned. To keep this glory, the first thing to do was to trample on the corpse of Germany and make sure it never rose again. The best way to do this was to dismember Germany. First, the French border should be pushed to the Rhine. The other countries annexed by Prussia, such as Bavaria and Saxony, should be independent, and Germany should no longer be called the German Empire, but the Rhine Empire. In other words, Germany should be restored to the situation of the Holy Roman Empire. As soon as this demand was made by France, Britain was the first to stand up and oppose it. Britain has always followed the policy of European balance. No one should be too strong. France can't be the hegemon of Europe. Lloyd George presented a long list of grandiose reasons why it was wrong to take back Alsace-Lorraine from Germany, which had been ceded in the Franco-Prussian War, without giving the local people a chance to vote on whether it should be returned to France or remain with Germany. At this point, Clemenceau was 76 years old, with white hair and a beard, and he was so angry that he was shaking. He pointed at Lloyd George and cursed him. Lloyd George was 20 years younger than Clemenceau, but he didn't care about being a gentleman or respecting the elderly and the young. He grabbed Clemenceau's collar and demanded an apology. When Wilson saw this, he quickly stepped in to separate them. But Clemenceau was still furious and wanted to duel with Lloyd George. Lloyd George said, let's duel then. Who's afraid of you, old man? I won't kill you. Fortunately, people around them kept them from actually dueling. Seeing that the dismemberment of Germany was not going to work, Clemenceau said, then France wants to get the Saar region of Germany. Why? Alsace and Lorraine were occupied by Germany for 50 years, and now France needs the Saar as extra compensation. Of course, George Clemenceau disagreed. The two argued fiercely. Clemenceau took the German map and chased George Clemenceau around the room, saying, This Saar is here, you have to give it to me. George Clemenceau ran ahead and said, No, no, no. I can't hear you. The two chased each other around the conference table until George Clemenceau was chased into the bathroom. Clemenceau followed him in. George Clemenceau said, I'm gonna pee here. Are you a gentleman? Clemenceau said, I'm waiting for you. You must agree to give me this land. If you don't agree, don't pee. Hold it in. Finally, Wilson proposed a compromise solution, deciding that France could occupy Saar for 15 years. After 15 years, a referendum would be held by the people of Saar to decide whether to join France or return to Germany. You said these two. How can the Prime Minister and Chancellor make such a mess? That's related to their own personalities. Clemenceau was known as the Tiger Prime Minister, treating enemies with no mercy like a tiger. His punishment plans for Germany, not to mention Britain and the United States, even the French had a lot of opposition. A left-wing politician hated him so much that he ambushed him on the way out and found an opportunity to shoot seven shots at Clemenceau. One of the bullets was stuck between Clemenceau's two ribs. Later, Clemenceau said, I don't recommend sentencing this man to death. I think he should go to the shooting range and practice his gun for a few more years before he is released. George Lloyd is a principled man, and he is a bit stubborn when it comes to principles. He once opposed Britain's war with the Boers, but at that time, Britain was full of angry people, thinking that it was a matter of beating a Boer. George Lloyd was not afraid, and he still publicly opposed it, almost being beaten to death by an angry crowd. But later, when the Boer War ended with heavy casualties, the British saw that George Lloyd was right. So after the Boer War, George Lloyd kept rising and eventually became Prime Minister of Britain. So to be a national leader, you have to have some determination, and it's definitely not good to be a two-faced person. It's even more interesting when the Paris Peace Conference discusses war reparations. How much did the French ask the Germans to pay? The French asked the Germans to pay a whopping 226 billion marks, which was equivalent to 226 billion gold marks. 
This number was so outrageous that even if the Germans sold all their bones, it wouldn't be enough to cover the cost. Clemenceau then said that the French had suffered the most, so they should get the lion's share of 58%. The British then said that was too much and offered 50%. Clemenceau refused and insisted on 58%. In the end, the Americans stepped in and said they wouldn't take a penny and offered 52%. They suggested that the Germans pay 20 billion first and the rest could be discussed later. The French then asked for the Germans' naval fleet, which made the British very uncomfortable as they considered the sea their domain. The French eventually dropped the demand and the Treaty of Versailles was signed. This treaty was a huge humiliation for the Germans as they lost one-eighth of their territory and one-tenth of their population, mainly to France, Alsace-Lorraine, and Poland, Pomerania, and West Prussia, which were the origins of the German people. Apart from that, Germany couldn't station troops west of the Rhine. Plus, they had to give up all their overseas colonies. That meant the British and French split up their colonies in Africa, and Japan got the Bismarck Archipelago, the Bonin Islands, and the Marianas in the Pacific. Even more harsh were the restrictions on Germany's military. The army was only allowed to keep seven divisions, with a total of no more than 100,000 people. No tanks, no heavy artillery, not even heavy machine guns. It was basically just a police force. The German Navy was limited to 15,000 people, no submarines, aircraft carriers, or main battleships. Just six battlecruisers, which was about the same as a Coast Guard. No Air Force, all existing planes and dirigibles had to be destroyed. Nothing could fly except kites. Germany received the treaty in April 1919, and then the Allies told them they had to sign it by June 23rd. No German representatives had been at the Paris Peace Conference, and now they were being told to sign it without any room for negotiation. When the German representatives arrived, they were put in a little hut surrounded by barbed wire, like a POW camp. After they had signed the treaty, one of them asked Clemenceau, what will history say about this? Meaning, we're all dirty in this deal, how will history judge it? Clemenceau said, history will not say that Belgium invaded Germany. Meaning, you lost, it's an invasion, no use arguing. The treaty was signed, but two days before, on June 21st, the German high seas fleet suddenly opened their seacocks in Scapa Flow, England, and sank themselves. How did they get there, and why did they do it? Subscribe to my channel and find out in the next video about what happened after the war.